Good morning. I can see still some of them are joining. Uh, last time, I think we stopped uh, on information risk. Part of the information risk we covered, and then we came up to, I think, uh, business continuity planning stage, and then we terminate the presentation on that day. And I think we'll start it from there. Um, I also have shared you this time the market risk management slides. After we complete this uh, portion of the information risk, we'll be starting market risk management thereafter. And um, to go into where we stop, I think uh, we discussed that uh, IT risk also very important risk. Um, considering the current level of IT being used in banking, because uh, we are not only into brick and mortar operation, that is branch banking, now we have gone into phone banking, ATMs, internet banking, and so on. As a result, uh, also it has helped the banks to serve large number of customers and also to provide greater convenience where their service is concerned. So IT is going to stay because uh, with the problem of COVID-19, um, more and more people are now onto uh, online banking. As a result, IT platforms are very important. So more you use on IT technology to serve your customers, there is also on the other side, we have the higher sec security levels that we need to be maintained as, as a result of uh, that we need to actually safeguard our systems. To do that, we need to have uh, information management uh, process going forward um, to safeguard that our systems and our computer assets and so on. So uh, we discuss what is I information security and then we also went what is cyber security uh then i also explain why the importance of um, technology in uh, nowadays banking and we also looked at the it strategy it strategies mainly how do you focus you put forward your it technologies into your systems and processes so as a result we also looked at how those processes will subject to risk. And then uh, we also said like in other management of other type of um, uh, risk like credit, we also discussed operations earlier, also, all those generally manage with the framework and the framework include policy, procedure and structure. And as a result, we create a policy document for information technology um, and uh, IT security. And also we draw up various procedure manuals. How do we take care of our systems? And uh, then also structures uh, it will describe the responsibility of each and everyone who are involved in the IT security as well as uh, IT users. So this management, we also said that we need to protect our assets, IT assets, our network, uh, and so on. So doing that management include uh, initially the identifying the IT security. So you need to maintain 
uh, various security incidents which have been taken place and uh, give me a minute Hey, you are recording if you So we had to stop to recheck our systems again. Something to do with IT. Um, the institute uh, agents, when they access this, they thought that I have not been connected. Now we are already connected. Um, so management of IT security, we also discussed saying that you need to record the IT incidents. Then you have to see how do you manage an integrity of protection of data. In that we talk about firewalls, we talk about uh, password controls, access systems, various other methods where you know we could uh, safeguard our systems. Then uh, time to time we also need to have incidents management, um, weaknesses and lessons learned in uh, managing IT security. We also said in Sri Lanka and uh, Central Bank of Sri Lanka also support all the financial institutions because they also have online connections with the financial institutions for collection of their data and also facilitates various money transfers which are going through Central Bank of Sri Lanka and also we may need to provide them uh, reports relating to various directions or regulations. So those things also now on the IT platform, we don't produce hard copies, you directly upload into their system for them to verify um, the information from the bank. So Central Bank of Sri Lanka also now come in to support the security aspects of IT uh, based on to Standards have been made. Uh, one team has been formed, which is called Compute Emergency Readiness Team. Um, all the banks participate in this and uh, verify their systems on a regular basis. And they also have set a standard, which will be a complete guideline for the banks to adhere to, which is called Baseline Security Standard. Then. Um, we went to on the legal side also. So earlier, you need to produce all hard copies in court cases. Now I think um, legal fraternity accepts uh, IT importance, and uh, they also accept uh, various um, information coming out of IT data. And uh, as a result, we. We have various acts which have been passed in the parliament called Computer Crimes Act, Transaction Act, the Payment Device Fraud Act, and Intellectual Property Act. These are which have been passed at parliament as acts. That's where we stopped the other day and we said we come into a, um, I think, uh, another important area called business continuity plan especially mainly i have tagged soon after it security the business continuity planning rather than putting it after the operational risk management simply because i think the continuity start with the uh, data availability for users to you know continue business so mainly if business get interrupt because of your systems go down and uh, so systems need to be up and running um, for the users uh, to give the customer service so so i uh, put soon after it security is being discussed this continuity planning because in this continuity business continuity planning 
not only the operation staff, risk management, and also IT staff, and um, general banking operation also need to participate in uh, formulating policies and the procedures relating to business continuity planning. So it's a process once again, and it is to reduce the organization risk arising from unexpected disruption. So banking operations are into various kind of departments. Certain departments need to um, quickly start their operations because they are serving a global community. And uh, we may not be able to inform the customers saying that our systems will be down from this time to this time when you're in a global sort of a environment. Uh, if you are one of your ATM is not functioning, you can actually set up a board there saying that from this time to this time, this particular machine will not function. But uh, on a system, you may not be able to do that. System will be accessed uh, in Sri Lanka as well as overseas. As a result, you need to go up and run. So as a therefore, business continuity planning is an important area. Also, it goes hand in hand with disaster recovery planning. So we will discuss that also in this same slides. Uh, so risk arising from unaccepted disruption of critical functions. Here I have mentioned critical functions for bank to operate. Especially critical functions include where you need to serve global clientele. And um, operations are crit critical functions. Operation is necessary for survival of the organization. So what we do here is making a plan that if bank get in disrupted due to various reasons, it could be an environmental external factor where um, something like earthquake, tsunami, or even COVID, those are external factors which are affecting disruption. Um, similarly, the weather, lightning, floods, fire, all these are external causes which can disrupt our operation. Um, we also can have disruption, a man-made, a sudden work to rule process or uh, and people, key people are not available to perform those. Those are also part of disruption and also failure of your IT system due to a, some technical problem, also the various factors which could happen, disruption. So the critical functions generally in this planning, we set up a time limit for us to restart the operations. Various critical functions, we may need immediate start and therefore um, we need to have a second system moment uh, your main frame get disrupted uh, there will be a time within a sort of time until you can't get that one going within a matter of we'll say half an hour or even less uh, your second system should get operated and uh, it get linked to various important critical functions of the bank so this is to building resilience using people, processes, and technology to prevent the prevent and recover from threat to our continuity. So in this, just to start a process, it won't just get automatic. So you need to entrust people to do certain uh, operations or certain processes which they have pre-identified earlier uh, for them to have a kick start. So we'll move on. So what uh, then I said that I will attach another section which is relevant to business continuity before 
generally business continuity will happen because of a disaster then uh, will you excuse me for a minute hello me abhi the kai ko nundi mama gedara gihin avasatawat kawanna de kiyala wage all right okay ड्यूरेट certain disasters if i had to give some examples like um, your computer have a technical difficulty um, and as a result it has to be stopped until uh, windows come and do it that something may have gone wrong with people's involvement or the operators involvement or any other external things which could happen is um, environmental disasters or man made disasters um, it could happen from tsunami to earthquake to fire burglary or terrorism whatever so this sort of disaster need immediate action from various people and uh, so disaster also should have a recovery and this recovery is generally been written down so that business could function again into its normalcy so activities and procedures designed to return to normalcy of the organization is called disaster recovery planning and uh, so business continuity planning and the disaster recovery planning will go hand in hand um so we will discuss why we need this uh bcb which is business continuity is coming from disaster disaster uh, disaster could bring in injury to people and damage to assets now in a bcp the first thing uh, we just have to assess if if it has come bcp is necessary based on a disaster we need to really identify are there any injuries to people because human assets is considered uh, that which cannot be replaced you can damage to assets of computer which can be replaced but the damage to human assets need immediate treatment and therefore the first thing on a bcp planning is we need to see based on the disaster whether there are injuries to people and if there is injuries to people they may need to rush to hospitals so in our disaster business continuity planning we give very much priority to for injuries to people attendance to human aspects of the disaster and rush them to hospital and make sure that they get immediate treatment then only you go into assess the damage Uh, damage to the assets base having done that then you can go on to the next step of which recovery response will be taken by who because bcp is a process where you know uh, we will see the disaster strikes and the people who are around that will immediately attend to the injuries and then you look at the structure who would attend to that to whom to be report uh, about the disaster in in an organization generally um, in our bcp plan a summary of the bcp plan should include that immediate information in case of a disaster to be given to whom and by who actually if if it happened in a branch you may need to inform certain people in head office something of this nature happens or you may need to inform police you may need to inform 
the health authorities to take care of your people. So most of the branches under the BCB Act, this information to whom you should report should be given name of a person or the institution and their telephone numbers. And ideally, these numbers should be familiarized by all staff. So in business country planning, it's not a single person um, because on a disaster, you will have managers, but you know, sometimes you even the minor staff will have to take the leadership and do these things. So therefore, this information are generally kept to the notice of everybody. If you have a notice board in your branch, these uh, important numbers should be in this so people could really see it. And or even somebody's this instruction should have the important telephone numbers in case of a disaster to whom to be informed and by whom. So these things also should be recorded and written down. Then the moment you do that, then you need to assess what resources are required to do the recovery. If your computer has gone bust, you may need to have a computer immediately replaced. If your branch has gone, if there's damage to entire building, you may need not only the computers, you may need to move out. And you should, I, by this time, you should know where you should be moving out. If it has happened to a to your only branch, your branch, probably your disaster business country plan will have a second location where your staff can be moved. Or if it has happened to a large area like a disaster by way of an earthquake or tsunami, they will identify a place away from this big center where you know the disaster stuck uh, by when you inform to somebody who is authority, they will identify a place where you know your staff could operate from. So this is also need resources are required, and um, we have to move on. How to prioritize recovery of business process? Now certain businesses can be delayed if you are processing a loan, and that customer can be served not immediately. But if you are processing a bank transfer from one bank to another, which you have undertaken already, then you need to have link to your head office uh, to inform them that we have undertaken transfer like this. Please through Central Bank of Sri Lanka that to affect that transfer. So certain amount of certain kind of activities need immediate recovery and you need to prioritize those and then um, your computers or whatever the center you engage should devote your assets to those prioritized business processes. Uh, if there's no one to take responsibility and guide, then it, it will be a, another disaster. So therefore um, you need to have at this point, identified people who will actually take responsibility for a situation of this nature. Then also you need to have people to really identify the processes which have got disrupted and find solution for those. Loss control and panic situations also will erupt because uh, this, these three items, the loss control and how to identify interrupted services and no one to take responsibility are creating delay in business continuity planning. So if you have planned all that in advance on a situation of this nature, you don't panic. Uh, you quickly know who is responsible at this point to take the disaster situation into a continuity and um, or restart your operations, then it will be easy. That's why we need to actually have a document prepared for business continuity plan. So 
So I already mentioned this. How do you address a disaster? GCP generally the first one is safety of personnel. It's very important uh, that you need to attend to the injured parties the first. Then only you go into the recovery activities and you will assess the damages. You will see whether you need to move out of the building or if it is so, which place you need to go. Various activities related to recovery will take at this. Then you will need to find terms of responsibilities. Uh, if your plan has identified who is responsible for what, then it will be very easy. Then at this point, when you know the people who are responsible, they need to find resources. If some of your resources have been damaged, you need to order from some place. And also, you should have guidelines to order. Your requirement committee will have certain additional resources in head office. They could immediately transfer them. Uh, so finding the resources and getting the resources to start the recovery process is very important. Then also we need to prioritize the business processes we need to first undertake and what you can postpone. Um, immediately rest of the things, you assess the damage and then mitigation action will take place. So this is very important, this subject. Prioritize safety of people who is responsible Assessing the damage are uh, important areas in a business continuity plan. So that is really a disaster recovery process, and with that, you should be able to start. Now, there are Another important areas uh, where disaster recovery is concerned, which may need to address by all the financial institutions, and it is being required by your regulator, Central Bank of Sri Lanka, to have various mock exercises uh, to do this. So those mock exercises include you create a scenario where actually the fire has taken place in your particular building. Uh, how do you react to such situations? And uh, generally in Colombo, some of the head officers, you will have this thing called fire drill. And uh, in if you are on a multi-storied building, that time all your lifts will get closed. So you may not be able to use your lift and come down. Then also there will be in most of buildings that they will identify the assembly area. So when you have a fire drill, your alarms will go. Generally most of the banks will not pre-announce this but they will also create a situation that including the fire brigade will come and uh, do their sirens. So the people really get panic and uh, to stop this panic, each floor of a multi-story building, you appoint a person uh, to be in charge of a fire drill. So that person, moment the alarm goes, without getting panic, that person will get rest of the staff in that particular uh, store, um, flow will move on to a staircase and then safely and steadily will climb down and then get into a fire assembly area. Once you get into that fire assembly area only you will come to know that this is a mock exercise but uh, some cases uh, most of the staff members know is a mock exercise but if you really want to see how business continuity operates or disaster preparedness in an institution you may need to really create a scenario that actually 
um, outside sources like fire brigade come in with the uh, sirens so that people will get assembled in the fire assembly area after following all the procedures which have been laid down in your BCP. Um, now in these situations, you also need to identify these are mock exercises. But to most of the banks also we have a center called Disaster Recovery Center. There you will have another mainframe computer station some other workstations also for critical areas to function and that that is most important thing because we call it at that moment you need to actually switch your uh, main from mainframe computer to a disaster recovery center mainframe from there all the information will get to your all stations especially if you have a large branch network so this is a very important area and some of the smaller banks will say about two or three branches they also need to have this and generally they have the disaster recovery center as the next line of uh, next line of identified station so you need to place certain resources there and especially if you are running a smaller firm they also need to have this disaster and there the problem is that that they will not announce and uh, when you come in the morning to work immediately you will see uh, somebody will announce saying that no, this function, this particular unit is not functioning today. You will get operated from a separate unit. So if your business continuity plan has mentioned who will go to the disaster recovery center, those people will have immediately uh, get into disaster recovery center and then do the switching off from mainframe and start work from there. So these are important things and generally at this point uh, we will know the preparedness for any disasters by an institution this is a very important area which is connected to it also because it support is needed to uh, switch on into a disaster recovery center mainframe and then connect to all branches um, so this also need even without a disaster sometime you need to run this uh, second main frame of computer on situation uh, of on a mock exercise so sometimes you switch on switch off your main system uh, and allow those people who are in charge Immediately saying that there's something wrong. Actually, there's not, not something wrong, but you know, it is purposefully switch on to see the preparedness to mainframe. Uh, preparedness for disaster recovery unit mainframe so that they can start business once again. So, this is how we manage disasters. And uh, so, Apart from the policies what we have discussed for credit related, operational related, then we look at um, computer related. Apart from that, we all the banks we need to have business continuity plan and disaster recovery plan. Another well documented uh, policies place so that uh, on a situation of this nature that they can address those uh, disasters and also to restart their business in a quick possible time so that business won't get disrupted um, especially if you are your treasury need to get really activated because they need to their online their 
connected to money market, they are connected to central bank uh, various units. And in order to do the transfers of fund transfers and various liquidity management uh, areas, as a result, those functions may need to immediately kick start and then the uh, rest of the functions you can prioritize for what is important and do the uh, planning subsequently. So with that, we are moving on to another important risk area called market risk. And um, if you can remember the balance sheet we had in that I mentioned current assets plus fixed assets equal to current liabilities, long-term liabilities and equity. On the current assets, I further described, we gave imports of cash. Cash actually provides liquidity for you to run your day-to-day -day transactions. You are ready to serve your customers and customers generally come for withdrawal of their deposits, um, their disbursement of their loans, and therefore you need large cash balances. Then apart from that, the second item I put investments. Now investments generally include treasury bills, treasury bonds. Um, you also invest on stocks and shares. You can invest on gold. You can invest on any other commodity. Also, banks need, those who are in international trade, they need to have foreign currency positions in order to manage their import-export businesses. So those, all those are under the current assets and if you have taken up a position we list them under investments but these investments will have two parts investments for to held until the maturity of that particular instrument or for certain trading purposes mostly market is market risk related to the positions taken for trade but however we need to look at the various uh, other things mainly it is market risk is called interest rate risk foreign exchange risk equity risk and commodity risk interest rates will arise from you know your investment in bonds and when the market rates fluctuate the yield on the bonds also will get fluctuate and as a result you can have a loss of profit. Similarly foreign exchange risk is you can have positions and if those positions are not hedged that means you have not taken up uh, you have not taken any hedging instruments against those positions those will also will get subject to risk if you can have foreign exchange fluctuations and those your positions held in foreign exchange will also will have either profit or loss if you have a loss then it's a head risk of foreign exchange equities also you have investments you have bought stocks and shares and their price can move in the market every day you can see from the stock exchange activities um, the price of the stocks will move and if it is moves in your favor you will have profit if it moves against you against the stocks what you have already hold then you will have a loss this process we call mark to market so you check with the market trades every day especially or in exchange and equity and also if you hold commodity like gold 
you need to your position need to get uh, to the current value what is prevailing in the market current value is the market rate available for these particular instruments on a given day and then you calculate your position based on the current market rate and see whether you have make a profit or you have make a loss and then if you have make a loss those are called your risk related to foreign exchange equity risk or common risk so we'll move on to this how do you manage these risks um, in separate way in our other slides um, market risk management also unit coming under your risk management unit i told you your risk management your chief risk officer will have at least four major areas under him which is credit risk operational risk market risk and information technology risk so we have already discussed credit risk um, then uh, we already discussed operation risk and we also discuss your information technologies the other important area coming under your chief risk officer uh, you need to have a other manager under him or chief manager under him for market risk management the market risk in my earlier slide i said it's related to equity interest rate risk liquidity risk common risk and exchange risk but they also have another additional function called liquidity risk management i am taking though it is uh, related to market risk management i will take the liquidity risk management in a separate um, session because it also i consider as a very important area because we are financial services we are in the financial services so the major risk what we have is the financial risk in that financial risk we also divide that financial risk into three parts three parts include credit risk market risk and liquid risk we have already taken and we have studied the credit risk credit risk is in your balance sheet but also when you take um, investment in, in various instruments also if you have failure to recover money or on your investment is also include credit risk but mainly uh, we have the instrument intact we have the position intact but you know the value get differentiate then that value change is called market risk so if you have a bond it relates to interest rates and so if uh, market rates change your price of your bond you are holding also will change if you have stocks and shares the market price of your stock and shares change will change and as a result you will have a risk in the equity risk if you have gold in the world market if prices of the this particular commodity change and the price of local loss will get automatically adjusted as a result you will have a commodity risk you need to have foreign exchange position in order to facilitate import export and as a result you will have various nostro and vostro accounts in other banks and creating positions for you either those positions can be long or short positions long means you will that is a credit balance that means you are having plus foreign exchange in your balance sheet and uh, that will go as an asset if you have a short position that means you have borrowed from various other financial institutions banks local and overseas then you have a liability and the current liabilities and both of them will get subject to fluctuation in the foreign exchange rate and if foreign exchange rates if you have a long position that means you have credit balance and if rate goes up in when you mark to market you will have a higher rupee value i will uh, 
to do that example that means uh, if you have 500 dollars uh, a credit balance and today the rate is we'll say 183 and tomorrow it goes to 184 immediately you get 500 into one today's your balance sheet will have 500 into 183 whatever the rupees there tomorrow if we change 184 uh, we have 184 into 500 and that is higher than the balance what you had previous day the difference is called exchange profit and exchange profit will get traded to your p and uh, so there's no risk there but imagine today you have 500 at the rate of 183 and tomorrow it goes to down to 182 so rather than you having a surplus tomorrow you will have a deficit and deficit is a loss and that loss also has to be debited to your profit and loss and making a loss is called you are running a exchange risk so that's how the exchange rate will create uh, a market risk component so what we do in uh, managing this we use various ways of uh, identification of risk generally we can mark to market now say if you have bond you've taken at 10 percent if the interest rates have come down to eight you are holding a bond value which is higher than the market rate you can sell your bond at 10 rupees and you can take the same value but at a lower interest rate in the current market so if the interest rates goes down immediately you can mark to market and have a profit recorded in you the profit and loss we will do exercises uh, do various things but i just told you the process what we adapt is for mark to market or we can also do certain scenario analysis uh, we can do what we call certain calculation called value at risk techniques which we will discuss again in our latter part of our this presentation or you can also have sensitivity test like you know rates being either move up or move down based on a certain scenario and if it moves up what will affect your position if it moves down what will affect your uh, position will be uh, computed and discussed in your later slides so interest is that simulate the equity also you mark to market now mark to market is i'll take another example say you have a, a share of say Ten thousand shares of John Keels. Now John Keels today it's trading at. Or oh, yesterday you had ten thousand. Yesterday your balance sheet was uh, will be reflecting John Keels. You have ten thousand into we'll say yesterday John Keels was trading at one hundred and ten. So one hundred and ten into ten thousand is the value what is appearing in your balance sheet under current assets in the investment column uh, subledge of john keel's equities so now today you'll say price has come down to 108 so you need to adjust your balance sheet because yesterday you recorded 110 into 10,000 and uh, Today it's, it has come down to 108. So you have suffered a 2 rupee loss on each share, and 2 rupee into 10,000 is 20,000. So there will be a debit to your PNL of 20,000. However, though we mark to market every day, generally banks have the ability to uh, just to view that 
and record it, the loss. At the end of the month, only you actually pass the real entries uh, based on the beginning of the month um, loss, uh, beginning of the month position against the beginning of the month market rate and end of the month. If there's a difference in favor, you marked as a profit. If you if a difference in uh, against you, and then you marked as a loss. So, but we do a daily mark to market to see our position because there are various other techniques we follow uh, to avoid risk. So, therefore, we do a daily mark to market to verify whether we have made a loss or profit. So, you also can similar technique like uh, sensitivity test called equity sh price shock. That also you can do daily or, or weekly to see based on a scenario. Uh, we can say scenario is like, you know, general elections. Now generally, when there's a political stability, your equity market also will get stable and uh, if it is currently under traded, if there's a general election day before general election, if you predict we will have a stable government, stock prices moves. Actually, on the fourth, stock market had I think nearly close to about over 50 points on the index as rose because they were expecting. Uh, win to a stable party so you can take that sort of scenario and you can say stock my prices will move by five percent and as a when it moves by five percent we'll see what happened to the stocks you are holding and your market price also will move up by five rupees based on that you will make profits similarly if you think few other shocks will come. If you have predicted when we go into election and soon after the election the COVID will spread. If you have that scenario taken into position, stock prices will go down the day before uh, the election and as a result your stock prices will get mark to market based on a new rate which you have predicted under that scenario and then it get prices you will have a plus position you also can uh, do a value at risk technique uh, to your portfolio based on we call it historical stimulation or historical simulation in this uh, exercise you can see value at risk is to verify under different confidence level over a certain period, how much money you have lost, and that could happen to your portfolio at any time. It's a prediction. We um, predict from the future losses. So interest rate and equity, we interest rate we looked at on a bond, equity we look at on a share. Community also, it's a community mainly main community, but banks in Sri Lanka deal is gold and the gold prices also has a international market price. Uh, generally it is uh, stated in one ounce of gold equal to so much of dollars. Currently I think gold is trading something like uh, one ounce is trading about 1000. 400 level uh, as a result of 500 level as a result gold has peaked up and it is so one ounce is consist of 28 grams and if you convert 1500 dollars into rupees and divide by 28 it will give how much each gram in rupees in Sri Lanka, we deal gold uh, uh, denominator is called sovereign. Sovereign is approximately about eight grams. 
So if you calculate and see what is the value of one gram. So one gram is achieved by you taking $1,500 into, we'll say 183, you get a rupee value. That is one ounce of gold is equal to that amount of rupee. That amount you divide by 28, you will get a price for one gram. One gram price into eight will give the price of your souring, which is we are commonly understand the price of gold is based on souring. So generally for that 1500 level of international gold trading, now a 24 karat uh, gold may work out to one sovereign will work to about close to 8,000 or 76,000. So based on that, we determine the price of the gold in Sri Lanka. So if we, if the bank undertake a purchase a gold and hold it, they are, they are running a position. That position will be generally at cost, will be in your balance sheet. Um, so if you have bought one sovereign at 1,500 uh, gold at 1,500 one ounce and then rupee value is this. Generally you buy in kilos. So you will convert that to see the value of a kilo of gold and then you put into your balance sheet and keep. When you sell you always looked at the market price. If the market goes up, generally banks will get rid of those gold to various identified dealers. Those are goldsmiths who have been authorized to buy gold from financial institutions. So bank hold this community by physically or they can hold it by only for paper and they can do transfers or they can do a physical transfer by way of selling it to uh, dealers. So this trading will give profit to the bank, but you know, trading will get riskier based on the, if the prices move down when you're having a long position of that commodity. Exchange rate also similar. We also discuss, uh, you can hold dollars and so when you hold dollars, you are running a position and this position is subject to exchange rate. And your position uh, based on exchange rate create profit or loss. And if it is loss, we call it exchange risk. Liquid risk we will discuss in a separate matter, but I have already listed uh, how do you manage this. To manage this, you should know your exposures. And uh, so we will set limits for how much we are going to hold. If to facilitate your import, if you can keep say $10 million is sufficient. So you set a limit for 10 million as your total exposure. Now these stop losses, it's another limit. Now say you have a share, which is John Kill share, which you have bought for 100 rupees and you're holding in your book and it's on a high vertical, not in a market sense. Uh, stop loss means with the current trend, your share price is going down with the COVID fear and all that. Tourism has affected this particular industry. John Kiris is heavily into tourism and as a result, their shares are going down, we say. So if you have bought 400, probably it would have moved to 110. And if you have not disposed them, and which has come up to 100, and now it is moving down. Now say, if your stop loss limit will say 10%, Bank will say, if it moves down to 10, 90, that means you have already reached 10% loss. 
and if it is that is the stock at that point to make him further losses bank will your investment committee of the bank will decide we have reached the stop loss limit which is 10% what we have said and this particular share which was bought everyone at 100 now has come down to 90 will deinvest this because it might go down further that sort of a limit is called stop loss limit then also we can give dealing limits now say um, the positions of foreign exchange will be created by you know your treasurers your dealers in the treasury will buy and sell so and uh, for them you can give them a deal in limit daylight and intraday limits also daylight means sometimes in order to um, buy and sell to buy on the same day and your intention is to hold uh, to sell on the same day but if you fail you can hold it for one day and uh, next day you may need to dispose them those are called daylight and intraday um, various other methods of you know forwards uh, counterparty limits country limits settlement limits also have been can be approved to limit the uh, losses arising from this all price losses which could arise from equity stocks the stocks and shares gold commodity or even the exchange position you can do value at risk measurement to verify uh, whether you are running a risk you also can do various other sensitivity analysis based on various scenarios on your open positions to verify whether you are at a risk position so we also central bank also give us various guidelines to do this sensitivity analysis our calculations method we follow in identifying market risk next slides we will in, uh, discuss them in detail um, moving on you need to understand if you are managing market risk in a bank bank has two books one is called trading book these are all i'm still talking about the under your balance sheet the current assets after cash i put investments then you get loans and advances now under investments you have various instruments you can take stocks and shares you can take uh, commodity gold you can uh, trade in shares bonds treasury bills even corporate bonds of various companies you can take take as investments and those are listed in your uh, investment portfolio apart from that bank in this investment in this investments on all these instruments some are taken for to do transactions to buy and sell some are you held until they are mature and you will enjoy the interest which has been already prescribed for those so what have been when you take a bond for the purpose of hold it until maturity will go into your banking book because you have made an investment for until its maturity if you have taken a bond for resale again we, we will park that investment in the trading book so anything on the trading book will get traded based on the decisions taken so you can in equity where stocks are concerned the, everything will go into your trading book because those have been taken to not to hold because there's no maturity date and uh, we'll sell uh, if you have some stocks which you want to hold as 
strategic investment, then you can move them into your banking book. But uh, generally, all the stocks will be held in the trading book. Similarly, gold. Gold will be held in the stock. And your investment in foreign currency or your holding in the foreign currency also will be in the trading book. So market risk is generally um, see that these trades will not create a loss position for the bank and uh, if you hold in maturity generally you will get interest so there's no risk so risk will generally ge generate in your trading activities so we list all the items in the trading book which we are planning to buy and sell so we'll also look at what are the source of, we also said interest rate equity risk, foreign exchange and commodity are the main reasons. So we'll see which book they will go into. If you have held uh, various bonds of maturity, they will go into banking book, which we will not have a, as a market risk factor. So. We, Anything which you have kept bonds for trading, or treasure bills for trading, will be listed in the trading book and that will be a source of market risk. Equity risk is generally all are for trading book, I said. So all your stocks will be listed in the trading book. Foreign exchange is in the trading book as well as in the banking book. Certain accounts, what you maintain with, um, your correspondence banks overseas, uh, say if you are issuing draft overseas by your agent to be settled in the currency of that particular country, you need to hold those credit balances in your account of that particular bank. So those are held in the banking book because those are needed to maintain. Uh, anything other than that, uh, in foreign exchange, if you're held for resale or to trade, those will be in the trading book. Commodity also can be held in the banking book as well as in the trading book. Generally, if it is, we are only doing gold, it will be in the trading book. We don't want to have gold reserves maintained as investment purposes. So these are the source of market risk. Now we look at the component of market risk. That means um, the framework for market risk. I told you when we discuss your credit risk management, operation risk management, uh, IT risk management, we also had a framework. In the framework include policies, procedure, and the structure. Similarly, market risk management also need all these three items going if you are to really manage the market risk. Uh, we already said board and senior management oversight. You remember when we mentioned about our three lines of defense, you have in the risk management unit, the middle section, we give the risk assurance is given by them. And uh, the first line of defense is your business line. They, they can trade, but you know, the, your treasury is in the business line. So they're in the business line, but in the middle, you have the market risk management. And um, generally, the treasury has been divided into three parts. We call it treasury front office, treasury middle office, treasury back office. And treasury front office is your business unit. And treasury middle office is in the risk management unit. So market risk of the treasury is managed by treasury middle office, which is already attached to the risk management unit. And this risk management unit will inform various market risk 
undertaken by the board of board and the senior management for their instructions and it will go from chief risk officer to executive market risk management committee then it will move to board in integrated risk management committee for their oversight and guidance so that's where at this level only they will decide risk appetite risk appetite is the amount of risk you want to take now that's where the limits will come your investment committee will say maximum we will invest in stocks will be 10 billion rupees so that is your risk appetite for your stocks um tolerance levels will come you know various sub limits will come for you know if you want to invest in john kills joints kills will come in the tourist sector so they will say okay we will engage in company in the leisure sector only our tolerance level for this is say 1 billion rupees so you will not invest more than 1 billion rupees in that particular sector you will have a tolerance level similarly you have risk appetite for what interest rates liquidity for exchange and positions and investment these will be created or documented in various policies so we will have policies like market risk management policy you will have market risk management procedure because this is needed for, to run your treasury because treasury will be uh, they are doing the operations based on the procedure of the market risk or sometimes they also will have treasury operations manual then we have assets and liability management policy this is a very important policy generally assets and liability management is done with the treasury your finance department and the middle office of your risk department middle office of the treasury is in the risk department so assets and liability management policy also another important area um come under market treasury management policy contingency liquidity management policy this also kind of a market risk function which we will take it up take it up liquidity management also then you will have a investment policy because all those sources of risk of market risk arise from when you do investment in treasury bills treasury bonds your stocks and shares and uh, your positions in the gold all this will come based on that so you need once this policy is done you also need to have organization structure who reports to who and what period of reporting is required how often these committees will meet all this will be recorded under this organization structure organization structure for market risk management include uh, managing the middle office who report to the risk management unit to the chief risk officer so you will have a market risk management and in this market risk management unit it's where the middle office is placed so when you have a treasury you will i said it is segregated into three sectors mainly for mitigation technique mitigation as a mitigation technique or segregation of duties to avoid risk taken from your treasury management so you will have risk management committees you will have uh alco assets and liability management committee you will have a units in treasury middle office which they adapt techniques and models they do various computations of market market or value at risk sensitivity analysis uh that's where the organization structure where the market risk is being placed so it is well defined you will have a chief manager market risk management who will report to chief risk officer chief risk officer will report to executive committee and then the executive committee will report to board integrated risk management those line 
of responsibilities by each person who is in that line is stated in this organization structure. So we have policies, we have certain procedures, and we have structure. So in this structure, what is important is, I already mentioned about division of responsibility between front, middle, and back offices. Generally, all the deals um, are done at the treasury front office. That means if, we, if a bank decide to buy a share, they are the one who contact the brokers and do the placement. If a, a bank decide to buy a bond, the bidding will take place from the treasury front office and uh, it will monitored by the middle office because generally in banks when do trading they say the trading is done on a trading platform and it, if this platform will get this uh, displayed on a screen and dealers have access to that screen and uh, they can do uh, bid process bidding will be done on this screen on online and uh, if there's acceptance they could conclude the deal and once the deal is concluded or bidding is done middle office also have access to this particular screen and uh, if biddings are done off the market trades so or what is not being traded now middle office can intervene and say uh, the rates what you offer is well above or well below the current rates and they can verify the reason for uh, that dealer's activity so as a result you control from the middle office uh, various transactions which are might result in market risk um, related transactions. So you have, a, if you are in the middle office, you have a very responsible role because though you don't trade uh, on your screen, you are actually monitoring every sale or purchase on your screen. The back office has a function of settlements now say if you have bought foreign currency worth of say one million dollars from another bank and the transfer will take place on the rate what you agree but this transfer entries need to be passed and that entries will be passed by back office based on the transaction already been approved then back office will have a definite time period for settlement and those settlements will be done by back office. So front office get debarred from, you know, once they enter into a deal, they cannot erase it. And uh, sale will lose, purchase will conclude only by back office uh, passing the entries. And middle office in the meantime, verify whether the rates are in market rates or they are off market trades and my bank wants to uh, get into that all sort of information can be derived from the front office before or even after they make the deal so division of responsibility is very important where market risk management is concerned especially the activities of the treasury will be monitored very closely by the middle office. Um, that way we could mitigate most of the market risks which may arise. Uh, foreign exchange risk mitigated through fixing limits and adopting war techniques on net token position. We will uh, have a slide actually how we do this. Generally most of the banks the holding of the net token position will be denominated in dollars. Now, say bank will decide maximum amount of dollar holding by your bank will be 
say five million. Maximum amount of amount what we are going to borrow from uh, other banks in dollar denominated will be five million. So when you say five million, either it can be a debit balance or credit balance. If you have a credit balance, you will have a long position. And uh, you will have debit balance, we call it a short position. Now, net open position is because you may have your accounts in various currencies. But for the purpose of computing and relating to your balance sheet, generally all those balances, whether it is in Euro or it is in Canadian dollars, Swiss francs, whatever the you know, whatever the foreign currency type of foreign currency, generally banks will apply the middle rate. We have generally in foreign exchange, we have a selling rate, we have middle rate, we have a uh, buying rate. You know, these all three rates are different. Middle rate is the one we from institution, from branch to head office or from bank to another bank, we'll get accounts will settle. So middle rate, what you do is you open other currencies. We apply the middle rate between dollar and that particular currency and we arrive at the position in dollars and that position in dollars will be subject to a limit. And it is not only your dollar denominated position, but you know, all the other currencies converted at the middle rate against that particular currency with dollar and you denominate all your position in foreign currencies in dollar. This, this position is, we call it, net open position. Net open position can be either debit or credit. If it is credit, you have long position. If it is debit, you will have short position. Uh, the next one line is liquid risk. I will have a separate session on that. Uh, Central bank, those days, they have asked us to do use this to and stock new flow approaches but now I think the Basel 3 has come so we will discuss these uh, approaches as well as Basel 3 when we discuss liquid risk. Then we looked at impact on profitability and capital. So if you run a market risk the impact will be to your PNL or to your capital. Therefore, you arrange various methods of, you know, uh, assessing the market risk. Finally, if you have a position, if you have a loss situation, that will hit your profitability and also it will affect your capital education. So when we do that, we will see how it happens uh, in a clear example. Um, equity portfolio is marked market. Which I have already told you uh, when we discuss about our stocks and shares. So, in this management of market risk, sale and purchase of foreign currency, valuations, limit to dealers, net open positions, regular stress tests are being carried out. We will uh, take one by one uh, when we do this establishment of Alco and independent middle office. So we also talk about assets and liability management, which also could help uh, market risk management. And therefore, risk management also participate in ELCO meetings. We also said treasury need to be divided into segregated into three areas. And the independent middle office, that means though this middle office will come under uh, it's a we call it a treasury middle office, but it doesn't come under treasury. And it does report to chief risk officer in risk management. Therefore, it can become an independent function, and which is very important 
to manage the market risk. Market risk analysis also we use stress test, maturity gaps in determining the interest rate risk. Then central bank direction for all these in market risk management come in the form of a direction number three of 2009. Uh, you remember I shared a document all, all the directions before 2013. If you go to direction number three in 2009, you will find it, it is related to market risk. So these are the function of the treasury middle office. Um, treasury middle office will be responsible for analyzing, monitoring, and reporting the risk exposure of banks treasury. So they have an independent function which uh, they can identify the risk taken by dealers, risks based on the exposures of the bank, and they have to do the reporting. Uh, Treasury operations while assuring adherence to policies and procedure laid down internally and, and laid down the regulator. So, Treasury operations also come under their purview and they also see whether the Treasury operations are carried out with the in adherence to the proced procedures and policies laid down by the regulator. So TMO reports to market risk management unit. TMO is a treasury middle office. It is coming under risk management and risk management has a sub management called market risk management unit. So treasury middle office report to market risk management unit and is responsible for reviewing and monitoring trading and investment activities, money market and other funding products, foreign currency and commodity exposures, equity trades, limit to runs, and investigation of any discrepancies of abnormal trends. So when you set up market limits, moment it exceeds, Treasury uh, middle office get really activated and they inform the market risk management. Market risk management will in turn, we'll report to the CEO and in worst case scenarios, they will can even run up to executive committee and also to the board integrated risk management. Basically, Treasury Middle Office perform risk review function on a real time basis. Now I need to stress on this, what is real time basis? Real time basis is as and when it happens. So I told you that they can have treasury dealers have a screen on which they trade. Same screen will have in the risk management unit under the supervision of treasury middle office uh, so that they will know exactly what's happening in the Treasury on real time basis. Real time basis as and when it happens. So, Treasury Middle Office has this importance of looking at real time basis transactions and see whether um, unnecessary risk will not be taken by the Treasury front office and real time monitoring will be done on various trades. Uh, we'll take a break now, it's 10 o'clock, and we'll reconvene at 10.30, because we may have, we, are on, uh, we have about 20 slides and we are halfway through. So today we will conclude uh, market risk management and then the next financial risk is the liquidity 
I will share the liquidity management slides next week. Uh, so with that, we will conclude the financial risk. We have already done uh, credit risk in that. Today we finished market risk. Then we also did operation risk management. Then we have two major risks, which is regulatory and strategic risk. With that, we are, in fact, we conclude our syllabus. However, we will do, um, for your knowledge, we also need, when you do regulatory risk, I will go into the Basel Accords. Uh, now we have gone to Basel three. it was very important. I will go into those records also. Then also we need to see stress testing, which is very important nowadays because risk managers are actually predictors of the future. They should be able to identify the risk now and predict the future so that you can take risk mitigation techniques in advance. Uh, to avoid losses to the bank. So we'll take a rest, uh, break now and we'll meet at 10 30. Thank you. So we stop at um, middle of his um, segregation of functions and uh, we'll see other functions what they do. Uh, in the middle of his, they will monitor the trading and investment activity on real time basis as I told you earlier because uh, uh, they want to check whether the decisions are based on current market rates. Those are within the dealer limits. Um, so kind of a monitoring function will be done by um, middle office. They will review transaction on real time basis. And they also will identify the stop loss limit breaches. Now say, if a share has a stop loss limit of say 10% and still uh, it has passed that 10% loss and still making more losses and uh, then it is a breach of limit. And if that happens, middle office can immediately bring that up and say, okay, now you have reached the stop loss limit and it's need to time to divest. And that kind of um, review or kind of uh, observation done by uh, middle office will be notified to relevant higher uh, officers in the organization structure for them to take decisions. Investigate operational discrepancies and abnormal trends like, you know, um, dealing stock brokers, dealing with stock brokers, aging speculative positions, and unreconciled items. Now, if they have held a, say, currency balance for a very long period, we'll say you have a um, currency, we'll say Swiss francs. There's no import export um, requirement currently now, but you are holding on, on a very long position. Mm either positive or negative for quite some time. And if it is not hedge, this may result in a foreign exchange loss. So that kind of um, investigations also need to be done by uh, Treasury Middle Office. Treasury Middle Office come under uh, risk department, uh, market risk department, uh, risk department, market risk unit. Um, 
or in next year community risk management also will be done by them so we'll move on on type of risk i told you when we started this market risk is about interest rate risk uh, equity risk foreign exchange risk and commodity risk so we looked at the these four types of risk separately and you will learn uh, how do you identify how do you measure how do you mitigate and how do you report monitor and control and report these traits based on our risk management process so first in identification when risk of loss of present and future interest income as a result of market interest rates impact in the mismatch between repricing maturities and interest rate sensitive assets and liabilities now i told you we have two books we have a trading book and we have a, a banking book now we'll first take the trading book because uh, computation of cal capital adequacy based on market risk is considered on the trading book only however we need to understand there are other interest rate sensitive assets and liabilities on both sides of the uh, balance sheet now we take for example on the asset side asset side we have first we have cash then i said we have investment under investment we have invested in treasury bills and bonds and these are interest rate denominated investments and they are mainly either it can be listed in your trading book or your banking book if bank decide to hold till maturity they are held in the banking book if bank decide to sell them at a later date to make profits then it will be held in trading book so on the investment side we have treasury bills and bonds uh, on the investments we have also have equity we have uh, commodity we have foreign exchange so those are price sensitive things those are not related to interest rate risk because they are not the yield coming out of those will be the capital gain on price so they are not interest rate sensitive then the other most important thing is under current assets we have uh, loans and advances now loans and advances are denominated in interest rate because you give a loan and you quote a interest rate and you apply that and you start calculating interest on that uh, so you give a draft you can give a loan you can give a short term loan you can give a revolving input loan all these loans and advances products are interest rate sensitive because you have allocated a certain interest rate on that based on interest rate prevalent at the time when you originated this transaction however the market rates change now you can remember market rates have come down very sharply during the last one year central bank of sri lanka has reduced generally interest rate is linked to the uh, interest rate decided by the monetary board and uh, monetary board decide two rates of interest they decide deposit rate they decide the advances rate if bank wants to place money in central bank the amount of money but they accept at what interest rate is the deposit rate if a bank wish to borrow money from central bank then you have to apply the borrowing rate now i think these two rates go something like six and a half um, or 6.25 into 6.75 i'm not 100 percent sure because so many changes took place soon after the covid even they reduced these rates so generally the market as a result of that 
all the loan products, the price have come down. You can see banks are now advertising home loans at even 9.5%. I think if you take a year ago, you will, you will never be able to buy, take a housing loan less than 11.5%, 12%. Now it has come down to even 9.5% because of the interest rate drop decided by the base rate. Uh, introduced by Central Bank of Sri Lanka. So, if you have agreed a loan, and say one year ago, and you have charged say fourteen percent, and now customer has taken this loan without we we'll say any clause saying that he has now say we don't take generally normal. Um, commercial loans like overdraft and various other facilities we take at a rate but you have agreed or we can decide on the floating rate but if you have given a fixed rate you may have agreed at 14 percent now same customer could go to a bank and borrow this that loan money at say 11 percent so just imagine if you have no clause attached to, if I am a customer and if I have no clause attached to my loan, either I will come to the bank and say, okay, please reprice my loan because you are charging more, whereas market rate is this. Or, or else I will bring money and settle the loan in full. Most of the corporate clients do this. They borrow money from another bank at the rate prevalent and settle their high interest denominated loans. So there will be a lot of uh, activity on this loan book when the interest rate changes. So we have risk based on this interest rate on the loan book because if you don't reprice, we might lose this loan because the customer will come and settle it. When you come and settle it, we have a problem called another factor because the money has come because you never expected that money to come that easy, uh, quickly. You have given them, we'll say, four years. Now in one year, you have got this money. Now you have a problem because that money need to be reinvested. Otherwise, what will happen? Uh, money will keep idle and you may have to put that money into central bank deposit and central bank will pay you six and a half percent then whereas probably when you price this you would have accepted deposits also at a higher rate and you will be paying high interest rate that risk is called reinvestment risk if a loan facility is being repaid in advance then the maturity date where it should come so you have additional cash coming in which need to be reinvested and because of that uh, it's like this mismatch of maturities of liabilities to assets that means uh, you have got more money coming in and in settlement of assets and that asset you have to create that money into another asset and that asset will be uh, either in the treasury bills or bond which will carry the lower interest than the commercial credit so that interest also called interest rate risk then we also have situation like this if uh, asset uh, if a premature withdrawal of deposit or premature uh, payment of uh, loan also will create a problem uh, because uh, we have a liquidity situation because when the premature deposit comes, you have cash coming in. When the uh, premature withdrawal comes, you have to you have a cash moving out, uh, which you have not planned because you had plans for that particular liability or the deposits to be paid at maturity. Whereas customer comes after three months and say, "I want to withdraw it." You will try and convince the customer to take a load, but if he says no, I am not interested, banks to keep up the reputation, they will 
allow this person to withdraw the money prematurely. Once it's withdrawn means you have put your money out, which you never intend to do earlier. So you have a outward cash flow which you haven't planned. Similarly, if a prepayment of loans come uh, before the maturity, you have a excess of cash coming in than what you have planned. This also creates an interest rate risk because uh, you will, when a premature loan comes, your interest income will drop from there because uh, the accrual of interest on that loan will stop from there. Similarly, accrual of deposit liability also will stop there if a deposit has been withdrawn. This interest is called embedded risk. So out of, we have interest rate, there are several types. I initially took the reinvestment embedded risk. Now rate of interest will change in assets and liabilities may change in different magnitude. Now I will have to take an example and show you what it is. We'll say because of change in interest rate, your deposit customers will be very happy to keep if they have a fixed rate. So uh, we'll say you have taken a 1 million deposit for five year term and bank use that 1 million rupees and lend for, we'll say again for five years at an interest rate of, if they have accepted the deposit at five year for 12%, bank would have given that for 14%. Now this customer, we don't have a penalty clause for pre-settlement. Now he comes and uh, tell, okay, market rate is this. Now I don't want, unless you uh, reduce the interest to 11%, I will have a uh, settle of this facility immediately. He will go to another bank, a corporate clients can go to another bank. He can easily borrow under current context at 11%. So now you have accepted the deposit at 12%, which will run for five years. You have given a loan at 14%, but now customer demands he wants the facility at 11%. And that is the market rate. So bank doesn't want to lose this loan going out, which will create further problems like liquidity cash coming in which you had to reinvest then they will agree for 11 percent so now you have a change of interest in deposit going at 12 percent whereas you are charging 11 percent so this difference is called the basis and uh, that interest risk is called basis risk so we have we will demonstrate this with the um, example Otherwise, you will not be able to understand. Uh, or probably I may have to do some homework and bring some slides like what we did uh, because of this online training doesn't allow me very much to do work on the board. And generally, working on the board require your inputs also and uh, your questions uh, to arrive, arouse uh, your undoubts. Therefore, I will do a demonstration of this with using figures to invent this. Then we also have these various investments. Uh, you can make an investment. Uh, we'll say you have invested on a 100 million bond, which is maturing, say, five years. And uh, if you held to maturity, you will have a, a value and a duration if you take the graph by by a straight line your interest will get accumulated but when the interest rate moves up and down there will be a curve in your gain and that curve is called yield curve and uh, if difference between your straight line and the curve is called yield curve risk because that difference also interest rate risk. That also I will explain to you when a bond goes, we will do a kind of a, uh, take a bond situation and when interest rates, we'll see what happened in your normal book, uh, in your trading book. So we will give demonstration of all these 
with some figures uh, we'll do a yield uh, the basis risk especially because assets and liabilities will have different magnitude of change uh, because always you can't match an asset to a liability therefore interest rates will deviate so moving on i will take effect of impact on change in interest rates in the banking book banking book has your all interest sensitive assets that means your all old drafts loans uh, short term loans revolving import loans all that are interest sensitive assets and they are given for a duration and they are not in a trading book they are given they are listed in the banking book so what you do is asset with high rate of gets prepaid now this is i told you if if you have given a higher interest rate sometimes when the interest rate goes down rates decline they may get paid and cash has to be reinvested at a lower rate or then you will have invest reinvestment risk you have interest rate risk because net interest income is going to go down because if you have predicted at a high rate of loan to be repaid over say a duration of 5 years you have predicted a certain amount of interest over this 5 years if this asset get repaid and the money comes and you have put into central bank treasury bills or bonds which will carry a low interest so net interest income will go down so when rates decline your banking book there can be a interest rate risk when rate increases sometimes asset get maturity expands some people will find it difficult to pay because now you have rate the increase we generally experience this if you take housing loans uh you arrange on a very uh fixed installment based on your income and most of the banks now they say the fixed income fixed rate will apply only for 2 years then on the third year if interest rates have gone up your in installment also will go up then what most of the clients will say now i i am very comfortable with paying the same amount therefore you increase the period of payment then the asset maturity get expands is that you are changing the enhancing the period of payment so institution has to fund it and precisely sometimes they want an additional amount then it has to be funded at a time the rates have gone up so the net interest income again will go down because you increase the rates and this has to be funded with high interest rate deposits and as a result so change in net in income is the measure when we take to see whether we have made uh, interest income net interest income that means interest income minus interest expenses is called net interest income in our profit and loss account the first item what we put is interest income then immediately like you deduct you say in another customers you put sales and you deduct cost of goods sold Sim similarly we take the interest income and we deduct interest expenses then customers will get gross profit banks will get net interest income so generally our measure of loss of interest based on this reducing or increasing net interest income if on a transaction we can enhance the net interest income that means we don't have interest rate risk you have made profit out of that change of situation but if your interest expense goes up as a result and then your net interest income comes down then you will have a loss of interest that is we call interest rate risk in the banking book now we move on to your trading book now trading book i have taken some figures actually these figures were done somewhere 
maybe eight, 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 nine years ago when I started this particular course. So I did this calculation. I had this chart with me, fortunately, as so I put into your, I shared with you. Uh, it is easy to explain on an online course when you have figures. So at that particular time, the government security is trading. That means uh, on the trading book, value of bonds, uh, the book value, book value is the amount the bank has invested was, uh, these are given in uh, billions or so 9 billion, uh, 573, uh, it's 9.5 billion, I would say, the actual amounts are given here. Um, then the market value is market value is determined based you if you had to sell this particular bonds on that particular day we took these figures in the market when you apply the market rate available for these bonds you will get 9.580 against 9.573 that means you have six point um, six million eight hundred and fifteen thousand profit out of uh, this book uh, transaction actually we are not selling it they held in the trading book but um, we do a market value to see how much money we have made on every day so on this particular day this is called fair value through pnl um, so we can if we sell we can book into our profit six eight six point eight months six million eight hundred fifteen thousand into our profit now we see if interest rate goes up and interest rate goes down what will happen to our bond uh, now we have 9.573 billion bonds which has a market value of 9.580 we see we have put into these two sides we say if interest rates goes up by 300 basic points basic points is when you say 300 is it 0.3 when you say 0 0.2 is uh, 200 basic points is 0 0.2 so on one side i have put you have an increase the other side decrease if interest rate decreases now you need to understand you are holding bonds bonds are actually deposits we made at the central bank and we'll say we this we made at 10 percent when we all the this entire 9.573 was made at 10 percent now on the right side decrease in yield means that means the current interest rate has gone down by 0.2 percent that is then you get 9.8 so when interest rate goes down you are having high interest rate instrument in your hand and that can be sold at that the same high interest rate because central bank is going to give you same rate because it is the declared rate on that particular bond so when interest rate goes down when you're having a high interest rate denominated instrument which can sell at the market higher than currently available bonds because currently available is central bank is giving less 0.2 9.8 so when you mark to market that bond, always even the interest rate goes down, you will have a higher mark to market value. You need to understand this. Uh, once again, I'll tell you. We'll say you have a fixed deposit with bank A. And this fixed deposit is generally not tradable. You have to actually go to the bank on maturity and take. We'll say you have a very innovative bank they say okay you can trade this fixed deposit you can sell it to our any other client the price you like so you have a fixed deposit which is 10 percent given and they will allow you to sell this 
rather than premature uh, up, uh, upliftment, they will allow you to sell this. And you held it for, we'll say this deposit for two years. After one year, and uh, actually this deposit, interest will be paid every six months. So what you do is interest you have got, every six months you have got the interest you hand. So one year gone means that that particular one year's interest is you have already taken. And so there's no accrual attached to this. After one year, now still you are carrying a deposit which you can sell at 10%. Now the market, now the bank is only giving 9.8. So you can always sell this, uh, your deposit more than the 9.8 because it has a 10% interest rate applied to it. So generally in the market, you should be able to sell this one for say 9.9 .9 or even more. So generally when you mark the market means you have the ability to sell in the market. So if you have two basic points down decrease, you still can sell the 9.573 bond for 10 billion and 003. This is calculated based on that particular date rates. If it is 300 points down, you can sell even more. You can sell for 10 billion, uh, 228 million. If interest rate goes up means, now market is offering high interest rate. Whereas you are having an instrument with a low interest rate. So, when you mark to market, if you can sell for 10, if the interest rates have gone up by two, you may not be able to uh, sell for 10, it will go less. So similarly, price will come down on your uh, yield unless you are able to keep it in maturity. So if you mark to market on a 9.5, if you want to sell immediately, you get a less value if interest rates have gone up in the market. So if interest rates have gone up by 200, you get only 9.190. If it is gone up by 300, you get 9007. So you can see this slide. Uh, and then you looked at whether you have make a profit or loss. Now say on, if interest rate goes up, you have made a 566 million loss on this side. And uh, 382 million loss if 200 goes up. If interest rate goes down, you have made, of 200 basis, you have made 429, you have made 654 on the other side. So net effect of this, you may have to deduct that 6815 6, from that loss uh, profit. Then uh, your, you deduct this 6815, which we have already made profit from these figures, then your net effect will come. So net effect is you have made 559 million loss if your 300 basis points goes up. You have made a loss of 376 if interest rates goes up by 200 basis points. Similarly, you have made profits on the other side, 436 and 661. This net effect you take as a percentage. So, so you, if you take a percentage, when interest rate goes up, you have made a loss of point, uh, 5.98 and 4.07, whereas you have made profit of 4.4 and 6.76. Now, when you get a situation like this, this will hit your PNL. Now, say, if your PNL at that point you need to analyze now this particular bank had a PNL which amount is not mentioned here. Uh, so that has revised the position based on loss. So probably they would have had uh, something like. 
1.6 million uh, yeah 1.9 million uh, profit uh, at that point and as a result of 559 million loss it has come down to 1.400 billion 489 similarly if profits are up on the decrease side it has gone to 4.2.4 billion and 2.7 billion this is the calculation we do when government securities if we take a scenario and say if interest rates are to be going down most of the banks which are holding investment portfolio they will sell and make a profit because they are carrying an instrument which is higher if rent interest rates are up they will try and make more investment so they will get more return rather than uh, when they sell this they will have to run at a loss so this is the way we looked at we call this price shock because actually interest rate uh, scenario we, we call it how the gains will uh, or the interest rate as a result of interest rate fluctuation whether you make a you make profit or loss is based on this so this chart you can do it for government securities because it is in our trading book now we need to look at you know banking book it is more complicated than this because here you can really identify the book value here you can mark to market and get the market value then you can immediately calculate the fair value through profit and loss on that particular time and then you can make a scenario uh, scenario has to be with some facts you can't just say interest rate will go down or go up uh, interest rate can now say when we had this covid situation um, central bank monetary board was considering that to revive the economy you have to give loans at a lower rate so they reduce the base rate that is the so somebody good economics will always would have predicted base rate adjustments will come because central bank every three months or six months they will reduce but they also have the ability to do it more often and it has happened more often and they have reduced more than two percent interest uh, during last one year reduction as a result we have now loans can be taken at a lesser rate and the depositors will have to bear with the minimum interest so that kind of prediction if you have done you would have done some adjustment to your government securities portfolio when interest rate goes down you need to uh, high value once you trade then make profits and um, if you have excess you may need to actually instead of putting in government securities you may need to find good credit for the customers to lend then you can make money provided that you can keep the uh, your liquidity ratios given by the central bank so now i am going to look at interest rate risk in the banking book this is we call it uh, um, we also call it repricing gap now i take example uh, here the example is this if you have trade sensitive assets now say generally banking book we have we take the cash flow of six months one year one to two years two to three years three to five years five years and above we can predict based on the loans what you have granted we can put our cash flows when these loans are granted at this period of maturities therefore between one to six months these loans will be repaid so we put that loans into that 
one to six months bucket. Then any loans which have been repaid between six to one year, we put them into that bucket. Similarly, I so this bucket will go on until five years and above. Similarly, your liabilities, liabilities, your deposits. Deposits also you can see, maturities you can see from your deposits and you see between one to six months, this much of liabilities will mature of which you have to pay the money. Now, my example here, um, measure impact of interest rate in the net interest rate income. Now, I have taken one bucket, we'll say one to six months. RSA stands for rate sensitive assets. That means 150 million worth of loans will be settled on this bucket. Whereas you will get uh, 160 million cash flow will come but uh, this cash flow has to be matched by deposits of 120 million. In this bucket, you have deposits of 120 million. So these loans are funded by deposits uh, of 120 million. As a result, you have a positive gap. Sometimes this can be negative because if your liabilities are high, this can be negative. But in my example, in your one to six months bucket of rate sensitive assets compared to rate sensitive liabilities, we have a gap of 30. That means your assets are 150 million, your liabilities are 120 million. We'll say if interest rate is go up by 50 basis points, 50 basis points means not 100, 200, it's 0.005. So you, to calculate the net interest income, what you do is the net interest income include gap into the rate change. If your rate sensitive assets and rate sensitive liabilities are in the same manner, that means you have in this bucket interest rate difference, uh, if there's a change, change is equal. That means these assets also will be priced at uh, 0.50 more or less. Your liability is also fine more or less. Then what will happen is interest rate gap, you look at it, is 0.15 because uh, you divide your gap 30 into your rate, you will 1.15. If it is goes up, you have a assets are more, therefore you have a profit of 0.15 million. If it would have been liabilities, then you would have a loss because gap will be a negative gap. Now, when you have a positive gap in this particular bucket and the rates are on both sides are same, increase, since your uh, assets are more, your interest income is more and your interest expense is low, lower than your interest income. And then you that particular gap into the rate change will give you the profit. And that profit is net interest income. Now, this is doesn't happen all the time. In banking, this is not the way it is happened. When your loans are more, uh, generally you immediately you reduce your deposits. If interest rate goes down, you re uh, reduce the interest rate. And um, if your interest rates go up in this situation, you increase the loans immediately and you increase more than the deposit rate. Now here, under second situation, what has happened is the change has come and bank has increased the interest rate of loans by 1.2%. And uh, deposits, they have increased by only 
now what happened is uh, you have 150 million in assets which have been increased by 0 0.12 that 0 0.12 is the 1.2 percent interest then you have 120 million in uh, liabilities you have increased by one so the difference between 115 to 0 0.12 minus 120 to 0.1 is 60. so if you increase the price of loans higher than your deposits bank will get high income so in this illustration what we do is just what the generally banks do you will somehow make sure that your net interest income will go up so in an interest rate scenario in your banking book this sensitive assets based on your gap you need to reprice it to make uh, your interest rate increase or decrease uh, loss can be minimized so in order to make profit you can always increase your assets more than your liabilities that means instead of giving customers deposit higher rate you can charge the customers higher rate on their loan naturally you will have net interest income higher than uh, what it was so this is how do you manage interest rate in the banking book earlier our example this is interest rate in your trading book so trading book include bonds now we look at now that is what the, what you call interest rate risk now we are going into the next area of foreign exchange now foreign exchange has two types of risks one is called transaction risk the other one is called translation risk now you know for in exchange we do transactions uh, some transactions we call it spot trades other one is forward trades now when you buy and sell if you always buy at a lower rate and sell at a higher rate you always make profit so buying and selling is the transaction risk but if you bought say hundred dollars at 183 and sold at 182 you are subject to transaction risk because you are making a foreign exchange loss because exchange rate has moved against the purchase rate what you have done that particular uh, foreign currency so risk that earning or capital may be negatively impacted by the adverse fluctuation of exchange rate is called exchange rate risk on the value of the open foreign currency position now here second one i am coming to translation risk you know banks will have various uh, accounts in various parts of the world in order to facilitate import export now say you will have in london uh, there are so many banks we'll take example if your bank has account in barclays bank your if you have a credit balance in that barclays bank account you have it in pounds if you have account in new york you can have let's say uh, city bank your bank has borrowed money from Citibank, then it will have a debit balance in the account and it will have it in dollars. Similarly, we have we do transactions world over. As a result, anything done in Europe, it will be denominated in euro. So similarly, we have if we done in Switzerland, still they carry um, they do transaction in either euro or uh, Swiss franc so your account will be denominated in that particular foreign currency what we do locally is we take all debit and credit balances of all those and we apply the middle rate applicable 
against US dollar. Now we say you have a sterling pound account. We'll say you have thousand sterling pounds, and middle rate to dollar on a sterling pound is we'll say 1.2. That means uh, your thousand sterling pounds into 1.2 will give you thousand will make one thousand two hundred dollars. So you actually take all your positions, either debit or credit into dollars based on the exchange rate between dollar and that particular foreign currency and you create a chart and arrive at the total position in dollars this position may be negative or positive if it is positive we call it a long if it is negative we call it a short now this net open position is generally given in dollars and your balance sheet on an everyday basis will carry this net open position into the rate applicable for that date for dollars in the market. We'll say when you took all those currencies of your bank, currencies and your accounts in all the currencies, you convert that into dollar and you will say you will have million dollars in credit in total and today the rate is 183 so your end of the day to your balance will be 183 into 1 million so 183 million you have rupees as foreign exchange now tomorrow comes still you are carrying the same amount we'll say 1 million general position will change uh, and the rates will come down 183 to 1 82 if you are having the same 1 million tomorrow balance sheet will only carry 182 million and that difference of 1 million is your foreign exchange loss and that is called translation risk of your net token position so transaction risk means when you do a transaction the buying and selling rates differ and then you can make a loss of profit but translation is based on your position so you need to understand that we'll do a, another chart. Now, how do you measure your profit and loss? This also taken a long time we deal in the same time. So I picked up the same thing. Um, generally, you see limit. All the banks, they will have a limit of foreign currency. Now say I told you this. The limit on this particular bank is six million dollars they can have either credit balance of six million in dollars or debit balance of six million dollars based on how their treasury thinks if prices are to move they will have always try to create credit balance because then you will have high value if rupees appreciating that means rate is one, one time it was 194 when covid stuck now you see 183 people at that point if banks decided so we borrow dollars as much as possible they would have gained this by now because rates have come down and as a result um, your debit balance has decreased when your debit balance decrease that means you are making profit so decision to make either long or short is it based on your prediction of the uh, how rate moves now this particular bank has a six million they can either hold six million dollars credit or debit on this particular day the position is one five four five that means one million four hundred fifty five positive and you can apply the rate now <laughs> this was done i think about eight years ago eight years ago the dollar to rupee was 131 now see how strong our currency is already 50 bucks or more than 50 bucks have gone up and uh, in value and uh, <coughs> i i can remember when i went to middle east for a job uh, which is in dirhams and that time dollar rate was some 37 rupees 
for rupee you when you get a dollar you get 37 uh, rupees now it is 183 you get a dollar and in middle east the currency was dirham that is in uae that time the rate between dirham and the dollar was 363 that means 3.63 dirhams equal to a dollar if you see even now if you have 3.63 uh, dirhams you can buy a dollar so you can see how badly our economy has affected or the rate has changed uh, therefore still we are having that's why we still call middle income or less developing country because of this currency is not strong that means economy need to be very strong that means your balance of payments your import exports should match now we always have a high import compared to a low export as a result we have a deficit and also we borrow a lot of money for our infrastructure projects as a result rupees getting depreciated so we leave that that's the economic jargon so in this particular day the bank has 1 million 545 million dollars at the rate of 131.4 so it is 203 million 022 was the balance sheet figure now we are doing a sensitivity analysis or we call it a shock uh, of the rate and um, this rate can change to various scenarios of say if in a particular month our balance of payments is improving rates will come down so rates can change we'll say on this side i have only two negatives because in sri lanka generally rate goes up so here i have put point uh, no two percent and three percent reduction in rate on the other side i have taken four one percent 1.5 2.5 and 3.5 so if rate changes what will happen is now say rate rate was 131.4 uh, no the first uh, three sides is minus huh? you have to check price change by minus so minus one minus two minus three on the other side plus 1.5 plus 2.5 plus 3.5 so if rate increases by 1.5 the middle rate was 1.1314 will go to 133.37 if it increased by 134.69 it goes to it increased by 2.5 it goes to 13469 if it is increased by 3.5 the exchange rate will rise up to 136 similarly on reduction one percent reduction means your 131.4 will come down to 130.09 two percent will reduce to 128.277 and three percent will reduce to 127.46 then your position of 1545 you apply to that or your balance sheet will figure in this way your current position is same the next line is 203022 if rate goes up what will happen is you have a positive balance of us dollars so you have higher value of rupee coming in so on to your left side what you have is 206 your 100 203 if it increased by 1.5 it will rise up to 206 2.5 increase will go to 208 million 3.5 will go to 210 million so from 203 to 210 million you have made 7 million profit on the other side if rate goes down you will have loss of 2 million if it is 1% down 4 million it goes to 2 
percent down and six million of three percent down so then you apply the current year's profit of that particular bank is uh, is not mentioned here but the change is been done uh, it's mentioned here two million uh, zero four nine one two seven was the position at that particular time but if these rates have created foreign exchange income or foreign exchange loss so if foreign exchange income comes the profits will go up by that particular difference so you can see when the interest rate uh, exchange rate goes up your profit has if it's 3.5 goes up from 2 billion 049 to 2 billion 056 so you have gained 7 billion profit and your profits have gone up now your capital base has assets and these assets are generally given uh, listed in risk weighted assets so your capital base will increase by the additional profit that you get so on your left we have 7 billion coming in 5 billion coming in 3 billion coming in based on different rates on the other side we have lost of 2 billion 3 4 million so your profit will uh, go up uh, go down on this side profit will go up on this side and when profit goes up your capital base also will go up and when profit goes down your capital base also goes down on this capital base you have assets those assets in the capital adequacy calculation will be taken as a risk weighted assets now say uh, you have loans given against deposits then the risk weight of those loans are zero if you are given pawning against gold also zero so though you have a capital base of uh, your asset base is higher your risk base assets may be lower so that you do the calculation of risk weighted assets and you take from your capital as a percentage of that that is your capital adequacy ratio and then you can see how capital adequacy has affected based on this transaction so profitability will get affected once the profit will get affected based on exchange um, sensitivity analysis and then your capital also will get changed if it is you are having positive dollars net position and rate goes up you always have a higher profit and also higher capital adequacy ratio if you are carrying this as a 1.545 uh, and you have a exchange rates coming down what will happen is you make a loss and the loss will not be reflected in your profits as well as in your uh, capital adequacy ratio this is the way you do analysis of foreign exchange we call this stress test or shock test uh, shock analysis or sensitivity analysis we call it and uh, but the assumption of increase of 3.5 2.5 1.5 has to be based on the real facts this could go up now you don't need to do all this if you have determined this is the rate is going to go up by this then you apply only that particular uh, rate and then you see the current position and see whether you have a profit or loss i hope you understand and probably you can do this calculation since you have this slide with you and practice yourself i used to do this if we had a kind of a interact session i would have do this in the board and explain you more but you know i got this exercise done and do the calculation and brought to you so you can practice at home now that's how you see the foreign exchange risk so how do you manage the foreign exchange risk you need to manage 
your transactions very well because now say if you are in a branch i come today i bring thousand dollars and you see your rate 183 i am agreed 183 into the 1000 i get my money i go home now you are keeping this money and uh, generally you, you don't sell foreign currency unless someone comes who wants to buy foreign currency but you are holding a position when you hold a position what will happen then it will get added to your net open position in the bank and then they have a translation risk but you buy currencies at 183 and head office inform you rate has come down to 182 by about 1130 and the same 1000 rupees 1000 dollars you have a customer who wants to buy it and he knows now the rate is 182 and you got to disperse that then you have a transaction risk of losing 1000 rupees on this foreign exchange a transaction you carried out that is what you call foreign transaction so you need to be vigilant and generally your head officers are vigilant when they're fixing and that's why we have this buying and selling uh, rates and generally sometimes we have a huge gap between those two as a result even the change of rate will not give you a transaction risk only thing is therefore if you are holding it and it will adapt to your position and your net open position uh, will affect if there is a rate change. Now we move on to the third type of uh, area where these called shares. Shares is very simple, it is price. It's like something you buy and sell. Uh, it's like gambling. You so you buy it for 100 and if same day if the price go to 102 and if you sell, Two rupees will come in you know, a profit that will add up to your system. So, but shares are not that easily, it's not uh, common to you sell. It's sometimes bank do various analysis of various companies, their corporate results, the chances that this company shares will go up, then you can make a capital. So, your investment committee do various uh, share valuations of different companies before they make investment but however adverse change may happen despite all those valuations now for instance before covid 19 one of the major area of economic activity is tourism and all the shares of this particular sector was very uh, profitable and a lot of people thought this is the sector to invest and they have put their money on John Keel's, Aitken's Pens, individual shares of like Pegasus Street Hotel and all that people have bought. Now, moment the COVID-19 stuck, it's a systemic risk that nobody, the entire system will come to a standstill where entire sensitivity portfolios like all entire sector of that tourism industry has come down price so all the shares of what i mentioned john kills atkins friends pegasus um, tangerine all these hotels which are listed on the stock exchange the prices have come down now because their expected earnings are going to come down because no business then that when you hit that risk, you cannot change change it because that will affect across the market. But there are certain forms for various other specific risks. Uh, for instance, CEO who manage one of the hotel chain resigned and joined the other one. There's a possibility that management controls will change as a result share prices can come down. Those are we call unsystemic risk. Uh, so 
shared risk can happen from systemic risk and unsystemic risk. So we need to actually, if you are into share trading, you may need to do company valuation. Then also you need to see fiscal factors, the environment, how it will affect these prices in the coming months before you make investment. We also have a stress test for shares. Now, similarly, we generally in the banks, like you know, inter when we do foreign exchange, you have limit. Now, this particular bank had limit of 800 million only can be, uh, no, 800 million is the capital of this particular bank. I have taken an example, and the risk weighted assets is. Uh, total assets is 6 billion 420 million. The capital adequacy at that time was 1245. We'll see how if share prices falls by 10%, 20%, and 40%, how it will affect. Now you have a total exposure to share market by this particular bank is 180 million. If it 10% drop, that means they lose 18 million. If it is 20% drop, they lose 36 million. And if it is 40% drop, you lose 70 million, 72 million. So the, your capital, which was 800, will get reduced because your 800, now there is a loss on your profit and your revenue will get lower. When your revenue get lower, you are Reserve and income will get affected, and then the capital will come down. So, 800 minus 18 will go get to 782. 800 minus um, 36 will give 766, and 72 will give 728. When your capital get reduced, your risk weight will go up. So, because your assets. Uh, your capital has to be divided by your risk weighted assets. So earlier your risk weight capital, capital adequacy ratio is 12.45. So reduction of 10% of your share capital will bring down your capital adequacy ratio to 12.21. If it is reduction is 20%, it will come down to 11.96. If it is 40%, it will go to 11.468. This is how you see the price shock or the equity price change as a risk factor in investing in stock market. So, but this magnitude of shock has to have some facts. You have to need, give a scenario. Now, COVID is a good situation. Now, the day the first patients was identified and uh, People who thought this will affect the tourism, and if they have sold their shares at that particular time, they would have saved 20% loss because now, from the time the COVID start, our share market has a 20% drop in the uh, prices. We have something like. John Kills, which was trading at 160 or 165, now come down to about 110. Commercial Bank, which was trading at about 110, now it is about 75. So 20% we have lost in the share market, those who held uh, at that time. But general good traders, they know when actually moment it happens it doesn't automatically get reduced over a period it get lost so people held on has lost as much as 20 percent so this is the basis of what i explained to you given in that example is once again uh, for your easy reference i have listed something um, actually this was the only slide which was available that calculation was done based on this slide so i explain on the workings on the slides probably if you when you read this you can understand better now we go into 
Now, similarly, gold prices also same. So, uh, e equity and gold is same because it's a buying and selling operation. You buy for 10 rupees and you sell for 8 rupees, you make loss, you buy for 10 rupees. Similarly, gold when banks buy, if the world market at that particular price only they will buy, if world market price goes up, they can get higher value, less they will get a loss. Now we go into a risk measurement called concept of value at risk. Generally, um, this measure is called, now we looked at scenario analysis early in our stress uh, test for, we did the test for shock test for when the interest rate moves on the banking book, we did stress for uh, your trading book, then we did for your open position on the foreign exchange, then we did for your equity. Now, that's a sensitivity test what we have done. There's another way of calculating the risk involved in a portfolio. Say you have a portfolio of foreign currency or you can have a portfolio of bonds. Um, based on historical revenues, what you have got from this particular portfolio, uh, you can apply a concept called value at risk and determine maximum amount you could lose while keeping this portfolio over a period because you can see certain days when you have a portfolio running for say one year or two years the revenues if you calculate revenues from this portfolio on a given date some days you will have plus some days you have minus so we can do a draft based on the revenue what you have got then we can identify the highest point where we have lost and so based on that we can do the calculate or we we can don't do the highest point we do an average point average highest um, of the revenue loss so i will do a small questions to make you understand better how much money you could lose on a portfolio because of normal market fluctuations now, if you held a portfolio for two years, under normal market conditions, interest rates move up and down, and then you have a revenue plus or revenue minus going on for two years. So generally you input all those revenues into a computer system and then record and get the average uh, uh, re revenue gain and loss similarly. Then in that, you get a middle point. Now, before that, my second question will come. The question is incomplete. If if I just say how much money on a portfolio you lose, it doesn't give you enough sense. So I will put this second question. Is um, we must qualify the answer only provided we know for how long and what is what confidence level. We can say because we are looking at the historical factors and generally in risk management we say history repeats that's why this value at risk is based on historical this is what has happened in the past so you think the same tendency will continue in the future also for us to arrive at this value at risk method so it is done on historical facts and we also had the time horizon is given in a one particular day or one week, in one month or in one year, the amount you can lose. So you can, the horizon is called the time period. And what percentage, probability, the chances of we are losing, we have to give a percentage. So we'll take an example. We'll say we have a portfolio, one portfolio of 1 million. They say in this 1 million, the value at risk per day is 5%. And 
that 5% is equal to rupees 10,000. These are, if you have 1 million, when you go uh, the, this calculation, average loss what you have made is uh, per day is maximum of 10,000 rupees we have lost. So when you give a statement like this, the answer is, that means 95% you are confident, your losses will not exceed more than 10,000 rupees a single day. Or in other words, there's a 5% chance that you might lose 10% or more in a single day. So when you do these transactions on this computer base, you will get a result of percentage of value at risk. Based on that, you calculate per day your maximum loss. That will give you a confidence level of 95%. If you say 5% chance of losing 10,000, that means you are now confident your 10,000 you will not lose, 95% you will not lose 10,000 rupees. All chance is there for 5% to lose 10,000. 10, this is what you call value at risk. And uh, uh, we will do this under stress test once again, how this chart has come. Uh, this actually need to do a uh, huge hotline. We may have to do this on a system in a computer. Um, this is the method we follow, but uh, I may not be able to work on that. Uh, probably you can go to YouTube and there are some, uh, to give a hint, uh, I, I will check and let you know because I think uh, I will bring a link and put you because there are some online programs. How do you use, uh, how do you do a calculation based on, um, instead of using a computer system, uh, you there are ways you can do it on an Excel sheet. And you've got to be a very master of Excel if you have to really do via calculation on Excel sheet. But the idea behind this, at the particular confidence level, the maximum amount you lose on a given horizon is the idea behind uh, value at risk method. Now a lot of people think this is a historical and uh, uh, value at risk measure is now even improved to go to a stress value at risk method. So I will try and do that stress value at risk method when you do the stress testing as our session. Now, when you have positions or portfolios, if you keep it, if the price also goes down or the rate goes down, you tend to lose. But there are risk management measures. You can reduce this loss by method called hedging. Hedging is a technique used to reduce the exposure to various risks. It can be interest rate risk, it can be exchange risk, it can be equity risk. You can, in hedging, what you mean, you uh, apply various derivative instruments. Actually, our syllabus doesn't have this, but for your knowledge, I'm just giving, even in Sri Lanka, these derivative things are not very much in practice, uh, except a few things like forward contracts. Derivatives have generally four types. These are the derivative instruments. You can call it forward contracts, futures contract, options, and swaps. So we'll first we'll see what are the spot contracts. Agreement between buyer and seller to pay immediately for the asset delivery. Now say I go to the bank with hundred dollars and you apply 193 and give me what we have done is a spot contract. That means my hundred dollars applied that particular rate. I got my rupees. So we have done this. Similarly, bank can do spot contracts with their importers. They can even uh, buy dollars in the market, quote in the current 
exchange rate under spot contracts. So it's a very simple thing, uh, agreement between a buyer and a seller. Forward contract is you agreed on a rate at a future date. Now say, if I am a customer, I want to open LC. And uh, on the day I open the LC, the rate will say 183. But I am scared because my settlement of my bill will be once my goods comes. If my goods are also to be manufactured overseas, my export on the other country will, will ask me three months to deliver goods. So I will not know how much will be the exchange rate when my goods comes because bank is going to apply that rate in settlement of my bill. But I can come to agreement with the bank. Okay, why, why don't you fix the exchange rate three months for me to say 183 is today. So bank will do various calculation based on predictions of exchange rate movements. Bank will say 185 is your rate after three months. So when goods comes after three months, my value of goods will be applied. Never mind whatever the rate in the bank, it will be applied at 185 because I have a contract with the bank, a forward contract to settle my bill at 185. Maybe the rate at that time will be 187, but still bank will have to apply 185 despite bank may lose. It may be 183, remain at 183 then still bank will apply 185 because bank has contracted with the importer to apply that trade. That is what you call forward rate. Then generally forward rates are um, done for foreign exchange transaction. These are irrevocable agreements. I told you, despite rate change at that particular time, bank will have to apply that. Uh, so I have given some notes on this, what is forward, which I explained uh, to you when I'm in futures contract. Future is similar to a transaction uh, of a agreement at a future date. Now what happened here is the agreement was between bank and the customer. It's a two-party agreement and now if you go in the international market there are exchanges who arrange these contracts now we'll say uh, i'm exporter and i go to the bank and say i'm getting some transaction say one million dollars after three months can you give a rate now what happened bank will inquire if they give 185 to me if 1 million comes and if it rate remains 183 bank will have to pocket out two rupees on every uh, dollar what they have contracted to pay me instead of that bank can go to a organized exchange now in overseas countries we have exchanges money actually we call it a capital markets they will say okay we'll give you a rate at 183 but we charge a small premium so they will somehow get a seller to sell dollars at that particular time at that price and uh, go in between rather than a contract between buyer and seller here this contract has to be arranged through an organized exchange. Then we call it a futures contract. And organized exchange also keep a margin. So the rate, the import will have to pay maybe little higher than what they've agreed with the uh, bank or even less if the organized market predicts uh, rates fluctuations are lower than what bank predicts, then they will have a profit options also contract 
Now those what we have discussed part forward, actual transaction will take place because and that particular one million dollars will come, your hundred my hundred dollars of change. So here contract is done, giving the holder right to buy or sell a stated cigarette a specified price on a particular date. Now like uh, forward contract actual transaction will take place at that particular time when the lc get to be lifted here buy the option is that to buy yourself it's an option that means you give a contract saying i want to buy one million dollars after three months can you give a quote and somebody will say it is 185 but uh, in the meantime, uh, during the period of contract, I think I should not execute this transaction. But arranging this transaction, I have paid a premium like a insurance. So what I do is initially I pay the insurance premium and then when before the contract day matures i will say no i opted to do away with the transaction then you have the option either to buy or sell that particular time so options is the right to execute or to avoid but when you avoid you have to pay a premium swap there's another area. This, I think, most of the banks does this now. Say, if a lot of Middle Eastern banks uh, have excess dollars. Now, you borrow these dollars in order to settle your import payments. Banks does this. Bank have you know shortage of dollars for customers to have import transaction. So they buy very short term, say we'll say three months. So fifty million dollars available in Bank A in the Middle East. You have a Bank B in Sri Lanka. Uh, what they do is fifty million is borrowed, and then they will say the interest rate is two point seven five, and deal is done. But what the Bank in Sri Lanka will have to pay in back again dollars so it's 50 million what they have got from a middle eastern bank they send it to central bank and ask them to you keep this 50 million as collateral and give me rupees which those rupees i will do the transaction which is required to do the imports of the custom and uh, therefore now 50 million dollars will go to central bank central bank will keep dollars and central bank will say i am giving you rupees 183 into 50 million dollars but my interest rate is the rate what central bank lent to the banks which will be 6.5 percent now bank has borrowed at two point 75% from Middle Eastern Bank and they have kept this 50 million with Central Bank and they have paid another 6.5 so it will be 9.25% bank's cost 6.5 plus 2.75 now banks knows exactly bank will have incurred for three months 9.75 on a uh, deal so bank will actually charge the customer the import customer who want 50 million worth of rupees to do this transaction they will price it at 12 percent and then the difference is the bank's profit since this 50 million worth of rupees otherwise they will have to take from various deposit customers now when you do that sort of a deposit taking Sometimes you may have to pay 
instead of 9.75 which was done so and then you have a lot of operational cost so banks opt to this swap arrangements because we have certain banks in middle east have excess dollars we get that and we we'll swap with the central bank and we get rupees and we do the transaction and banks will make money however central bank has given each bank a swap limit otherwise um, this way of dealing is much more profitable than taking money from depositors so these are the four derivative instruments which is not in your syllabus but you know for your knowledge i have given that now risk management in market risk is i told you you need to manage exposures you remember we said open uh, position of your exchange was in that particular bank was 6 million risk limits risk limit is the limit we give to various exposures now say you looked at um, uh, equity portfolio the maximum amount what each investment can do it on a different company we are given those are called risk limits then we have stop loss limit if that investment is making losses like you know your share price is crashing we keep 10% and if it fall below on the third day on the day it exceed 10% your losses amount into 11% then you get into the stop loss limit and that point generally your investment committee will decide to dispose that despite you have made a loss what happens is if you give them you go on making more losses and uh, generally now you need we discuss about two books one is uh, your trading book the other one is your banking book uh, trading book we did various sensitivity analysis to see what is our market risk is uh, the loss coming out of market risk especially your interest rate risk now alco is the assets and liability management is pertinent to your banking book because that risk what we calculate on your interest is your banking book we looked at the interest rate sensitive assets against interest rate sensitive liabilities now alco's primary job is to actually to see the bank's liquidity spread between interest income and interest expense remain adequate so to educate you need your nni that is net interest income should be always positive in transaction therefore alco is responsible for managing the rates of interest rate sensitive assets and liabilities so this is one of the functions so that's why i have put it here but there are other functions because they need to strategically manage the balance sheet to mismatches of assets and liabilities that we will discuss when we go on to uh, liquid risk again manage the market and liquid risk we are touching we today we looked at the market risk also alco also responsible to look at the market risk factors funding and capital planning that means if your capital adequacy ratio is even is 14% and based on various market risk you are it is falling this managing this capital planning is also alco part of alco job profitability and growth also uh, alco job product development now say we may have different products uh, alco also will participate in um, formulating those new products then also they have a huge responsibility for reporting to the regulator of various liquidity measures uh, various capital adequacy measures all those regulatory requirements will come under the purview of assets and liability committee so that's where we on market risk so i think it's very comprehensive and i touch little bit beyond 
the your requirement on the syllabus but those computations you may have to actually work it out and see whether what i explained works because it's very important because um, those are the computations needed to understand the market risk of interest rate or in exchange risk equity risk and the commodity risk commodity and equities are actually called price risk because those are actually buying and selling risks so it's easy to understand foreign exchange risk include transaction risk as well as translation risk which is mainly what is very important is the translation risk which is open uh, position because when you are when you have a position you are always subject to risk definitely interest rate is very important because you have positions in portfolios in bonds as well as you have in banking book asset sensitivity uh, risk sensitivity assets and risk sensitivity liability so this is what is the market risk is about hope you understood the concept and um, uh, and it's a, another important area in banking financial risk so now we have covered credit and market risk where financial risk is concerned next week i will share with you the liquid risk uh, slides and thereafter we, we have covered the financial risk part of it then you are in a position to answer a lot of question in your exam and also to do the individual assignment so after another two sessions i will do give you the individual assignments for you to work on and then we will have one session for our past papers then you will be ready for the exam thank you very much uh, you can give me any inputs on your chat uh, whether you understood whether i need to explain this um, then uh, i will take up at the next session your queries thank you very much